It's a Trev Stone show, you need a veteran, a pro, whose head is in the know, ripping Michigan cold, up a peninsula bruh, but worldwide listeners, a million views on the internet, I'm pro sports extra, dishing it with the ghost who's interviewing us 12 years old, that's how I lead it, this chat with comedians, athletes, sad a genius, news so fast it's immediate, way past intermediate, podcasts you're needing it, facts you computer shit, that's what the future is, guests are about cash, cash, entrepreneurship, moving on the music jam, in the hottest Instagram models, you can view the gram. Get the inner insight of those that had their wins right. Get a higher view through a window like a sand flight. You desire for the truth, entertainment trends right. So it's time to start the show and get the insight. All right, guys, welcome to episode five of the Trev Stone Show. This episode, we have on special guest John Brankis from Sports Science. Um, honestly, one of the bigger guests that we've had on the show is. His program's been all over Fox. He's won six Emmys. He's one he best selling author. John was an awesome guest. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this one. We dig deep into his opinion on COVID, his opinion on uh girls playing with men in sports, which is really interesting. And something that I've honestly like I've heard, but it like kind of blew my mind of that idea ever even happening. But John kind of shines some light into that. Yeah, no, it was it was kind of cool to hear that because that's uh you know, why not? <laughs> right, yeah. He's not advocating for, you know, lesser talent to make it. He's just trying to open the door for new athletes. But yeah, it was kind of cool to hear him talk about that and, you know, how he started sports science. He basically made it himself. Right. Yeah, it was definitely uh, one of the better episodes that we've had on this series. So, guys, I hope you enjoy. And if you do, be sure to like, rate, and subscribe. We'll see you on the other end. All right, guys. We... <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we got a special guest tonight. He's the creator of the TV show Sports Science. He's also doing some stuff with uh, Drink right now. And, uh, yeah, we got John on. John, how's this going? What's up, man? I'm doing Good okay, man. I'm I'm all right. I'm actually pretty sick right now. I got a terrible stomach ache. We were supposed to record oh. this earlier in the day. So if I get up in the middle of this podcast, I have to go shit. That's okay. Yeah, it's, you know it's what? Here's... My recommendation. Yeah, it, it's not a, My it's not a, so, it's not COVID, so that's good. Yeah, it's not. Well, you know what? I, well, why don't you just go to the hospital, roll the dice, see what happens? Right. <laughs> so uh, let, let's jump into it, man. You, you are the guy who created Sports Science, the TV show, yep. one of the most popular sports shows ever. Mm-hmm. What all went into that? You know, I had a production company um, that specialized in sport TV and science TV. And we literally had two divisions of the company and we were doing all the production for the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals, New York Rangers, Coyotes, Rams, whole bunch of teams. Um, And we're really thriving in coaches shows, player features, anything that had to do with sports content. The other side of our company was a science uh, um, science division doing programs for the Discovery Channel, National Geographic. Science Live, the Young Scientist Challenge. We then put those things together in a show called XMA, Extreme Martial Arts. Um, Tom Cruise did the rap sport. It was tied in with The Last Samurai. That was so successful. We did a show with uh, National Geographic called Fight Science. We got the world's greatest martial artists to come in, punch and kick the crap out of a crash test dummy to see which style generated the most amount of force. That was so successful. Top 10 of all time for Geographic. Uh, Fox owns National Geographic and Fox Sports. They said, oh my God, this fight sign thing is amazing. What else do you have? We said, we're going to take that approach and apply it to all of sport. So we, we launched sports science on Fox sports. Originally it ran two seasons, won three Emmys. Um, then went over to ESPN, did another 1800 episodes, wow. won another three Emmys, wrote a New York times bestselling book. Um, really was, was became very entrenched in the uh, sports universe. And, you know, I think we made a little dent in the sports universe of, uh, you know, allowing people to look at sport through a different lens. Right, for sure. What, what, like, growing up, did you play sports? Was there something behind that? Dude, I was the center fielder for the Yankees. You didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't see that. We were looking yeah, you up. We, we mean, didn't see that one. No, I, uh, <laughs> you know, growing up, I grew up in the D.C. area. And, uh, I, you know, we, D.C. used to be, you know, Sports Town USA. We had three Super Bowls with the Redskins. We had a World Series with uh, Cal Ripken's Orioles. NBA Championship with the Washington Bullets. So I grew up as a massive sports fan. Um, And as an athlete myself, I was exceedingly 
exceptionally average. So I was never like, oh my God, what an amazing athlete. And certainly as I got older, I actually sort of, um, you know, fell back in the pack and it really raised my curiosity of like, why can I not perform to the level that other people who are small like me, I was the small, always the smallest guy. I'm, I'm, I'm five, eight. Yeah. You know, I was five, four foot eight entering high school, 86 pounds. I was tiny. <laughs> so the, it always fascinated me and it drove, you know, my love of science, my love of sport really drove me to having a true appreciation for people um, and for athletes and trying to figure out how do they do that. And that really has genuinely been an interest of mine from a young age. Right. That's pretty interesting. Uh, Nick, you want to fire away a couple? Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned the production company. How did you um, kind of get involved with that? How did that all begin? Yeah, you know, um, I was in college and I knew I wanted to be in entertainment. So I hooked up with Steven Soderbergh, who had just finished directing Sex, Lies and Videotape. Um, and he said, learn to do everything yourself. So I literally taught myself to write, direct, shoot, edit, do everything. And we had this, uh, when we started our company, it was we had this crazy machine called an Avid. That was a nonlinear digital editing system. We were the first ones to have it in the DC area. Um, and it really gave us an advantage because I knew how to edit on a nonlinear digital editing system. We shot really cool stuff. And ultimately, I developed a skill set uh, where you're pitching all the time. So when it, I love this, I love sort of uh, Ray Lewis is a really good friend. And he always says, you never know who's watching. It's the biggest thing, biggest lesson in life. Do what's right. You never know who's watching. And when I went right. in to pitch sports science with Fox, um, the general manager was like, well, who you want to get to host it? And I said, whoever you want to pay, you know, we own the show. You're going to license it from us. Who do you want to get to host it? And he ended up saying, how about you host it? I really <laughs> like the way you deliver a message, like your energy. And yeah. I'm like, okay. Sure. I mean, if I suck, I'll fire myself. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, 11 years later, it just ran and it just worked out. But as it turns out, you know, pitching shows, being a science fanatic, being a sports fan prepared me for that moment in time. So, you know, I owned the company, created the show, ended up hosting it, and it created this whole line of business and, and something that was completely unforeseeable. It was never my goal. That was never the intention, <laughs> but it's something like anything else, an opportunity comes along you seize right. it and then you build upon it yeah absolutely right. you, were, Did you ever uh, do you anything were... else on camera before that or that was that, that was that that was really it honestly. okay <laughs> you know hosting sports science was the first thing that uh that i'd really done other than you know isolated interviews promoting a show because you know sure. sports science was one of like 17 different shows that we had yeah so we produced you know hundreds and you know even thousands of hours of content um and sports science was just the best known so i was while mm -hmm. i was running a company that was a production company. I also was hosting the show, um, okay. which was just, you know, part of my job. So you were used as almost a stunt devil throughout some of your episodes. Yeah. That was like almost my favorite part growing up, getting to watch John get crushed throughout every episode. Yep. Um, what went into all of that? Were you, did you want to do that? That was never the original intent. What <laughs> ended up happening was we had some incredible athletes in and, you know, like Rampage Jackson came in and, and, you know, I'm rapping with them. We're like, God, how do we show how strong he is and, you know, how big he is? And, you know, he just picked me up like a rag doll and started throwing me around. So, <laughs> you know, we were all like, you know what? Maybe being average, you know, 5'8", 160, maybe be, being the average size is a great way for people to relate to how amazing right. athletes actually yeah. are. Yeah. And because I'm an average athlete, I'm like, look, I'm the guy sitting at home watching sports science right now. So it became very relatable. So, when I went up against Indomitian Sue or Aaron Donald or Dwight Freeney or getting choked <laughs> out by Gina Carano or BJ Penn or, you know, Fedor or whomever, you know, I made myself the human crash test dummy and just became really entertaining, really viral. You know, it ended up right. just working, you know? Sure. How long would some of the episodes take? Because I remember one, the Kevin Love one, the full court shot. How yeah. long would an episode like that take? So, you know, honestly, the Kevin Love one is a really great example. Sometimes, the experiments that we would do, you know, would take, you know, maybe a half hour to an hour. Right. So you'd be in, you'd be out, you know, we're never paying anybody to be there. Everyone's doing it because they just love it. And Kevin Love was there in, in that episode. I'm like, well, why don't we try to set a world record for the longest shot? And he's like, no problem. The record was 91 feet. We were going for 92 feet, which would be a full court shot. He ended up, he was, he shot it once. He shot it twice. He shot it three times. 
literally was shooting for hours. We even took a lunch break and I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm, it's just not working out. Like it, it's no big deal. Appreciate you coming in. You know, we'll get them next time. He ended up literally saying, and it's on camera, what's on camera. Yeah. There is nothing produced, nothing fake where I'm like, this is one last try. I'm not saying this <laughs> for camera. I'm saying uh -huh. this legitimately. I'm paying this crew. I got to make a show. Kevin, I love you, but this is your last shot. And he ends up making right. it. So it was wow. pretty crazy. You know, sometimes <laughs> it takes, you know, a little bit of time. Sometimes it takes longer. Right. Um, um, you mentioned I... you mentioned a lot of athletes already. Um, yep. Is there one you can say is the most freakish athlete, I guess? Or is you it know, kind of hard through, to? It, it, it's interesting because. You know, someone like Ray, you know, Ray Lewis, super good friend of mine. People are like, oh, my God, he's a beast. He's amazing. I mean, truthfully, and Ray will tell you this. I mean, obviously, Ray Lewis is big and strong, yeah. obviously. But he's not 6'6", six, six, you know, mm -hmm. 290. You know, the guy is he's a he's a, a he's an, a linebacker who's he's agile, but he's not super fast. He's what's amazing is how. When you look at everything scientifically and you go, oh, my God, these, you know, these men and women are freaks of nature. They're so fast, so big, so strong. Yes, that impresses me. But the people who impress me more are those who are not at the top of the curve of everything. They're not the biggest, sure. the strongest, the fastest. They're just the best. So you take Jerry Rice, for example. We had him in. And I'm like, Jerry, no disrespect. You're not Calvin Johnson. You know, right. you're not this giant towering receiver. You're not you're not even the top. 400 fastest receivers of all time. And somehow you're the, you are undeniably the best. He's like, that's because my routes were more precise. I practiced harder. And I always knew the guys behind me were more physically gifted. That meant that I had to be better. I had to practice more. Those are the kind of athletes that you're like, that impresses me more than just someone coming in sure. who, you know, has a 42 inch vertical leap, you know, mm -hmm. and is amazing. That's incredible. But if you are, if you are that physically gifted, you should be doing something amazing. You know, if you're somebody like, you know, if you look at somebody like myself and then and I'm 5'8", 160, and you look at like Earl Thomas in the <laughs> NFL, I'm slightly taller than he is. And he's one of the greatest safeties. That impresses me more than Jadavion Clowney, who if, you know, if I was Jadavion Clowney's sides, I should be playing something. Right. You know, it's like right. if you're that big, that strong, that fast. It's yeah. not, it, it's not that, uh, it, it's in no way am I putting down athletic ability. I'm saying that, you know, Drew Brees and, you know, Russell Wilson being guys who are six feet or under really impress me and make me right. go, wow, they're doing a lot with a physical set. That's not the, you know, automatically the best in the world. They have to work at it really hard. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, one more thing, the TED Talk. I, I watched it back. You gave a yeah. TED Talk, and it's actually really like a lot of people were hating on your TED Talk. Oh, yeah. I found it interesting. Do you actually think women and men or girls and boys should play together when they're growing up and maybe even to the pros? I do, man. And, and what's amazing, so, you know, go to YouTube, type in John Branca's TED Talk. And the premise is look, we are selling girls short from the word go. And the art, I, like I like to address this argument of whether or not boys and girls should be playing together. Let's just go on science. Let's just purely science. Take all of your bias and put it aside. And when we, we're in 2020 now, how in the world does every golf course have a ladies tee? I mean, imagine how insulting that is. Why is it the ladies tee? And then you'll say, oh, because ladies don't hit the ball as far as a man. Really? Like who said that? Right. What but what evidence is there that women do not hit the ball as far as men? Is Rory McIlroy a big hulking giant beast who can smash the ball because he's a man? There are plenty of women who can hit the ball farther than Rory McIlroy. There, in fact, the world record for a woman in the long drive competition is 402 yards. Do you want her teeing off from the ladies' tee? So let's just recalibrate our mind and say. Maybe, just maybe, by messaging to girls, you're not as big, you're not as strong, you're not as fast. In all the pro sports on the men and women's side, women will have different rules because why? They're women. We got to make it easier for them. We got to change it. I'm like, that's insulting. There's no evidence in many, many sports that a woman is at a disadvantage. Now everyone says, oh, well, 
a woman's never going to play on the offensive line in football. It's like, guess what? Neither am I. Neither, <laughs> neither is, literally, you know yeah. the percentage of people on the planet who can play the offensive line in football in the world? It's <laughs> zero point. This is a true stat. Zero point zero 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 two. That's zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nobody's playing. No so one. Yeah. Why diss on women in general? Because they're pl- they can't play something that men really don't play either. Just the very few elite people who are that big can actually do it. And then you think to yourself, so why why do we have women's basketball? I mean, you heard Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, right before he died. Week before he died, he said women should be playing with men in the NBA. I said it, yeah. and everyone's like, ah, you're crazy. <laughs> Kobe said it, and people are like, yeah, maybe. I'm like, right. there's no yeah. reason. It's not like they're inherently slower. Are women inherently weaker? Sure. But do you, how strong do you need to be? I mean, you don't right, need right. to be the strongest man will always be stronger than the strongest woman. And the fastest man will always be faster than the fastest woman. Fine. But guess what? Women are better endurance athletes. So the best endurance athlete on the female side will be better than the best, best endurance athlete on the male side. It's fine to be able to say that kind of stuff. So I don't want to hear people say, oh, you know, you're somehow you know, saying like, I'm like, I don't even understand the argument against it because it's just your bias. You're, you, you just have been thinking through a a very um, antiquated lens that somehow men and women should not be playing together or boys and girls from day one. My point is let nature weed them out. I got cut from my baseball team. Let girls play baseball and let them get cut. Don't give them a separate sport in softball. They can play baseball just as well as anybody else. I can yeah. definitely see both ways for sure now because before coming into this, I was almost like, all right, we have a if we have a woman back at running back going up against like getting hit by and Dominican Sue once, I feel like then it's over. But that's just like the mentality that we have just kind of growing up, right? Yeah, and 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 I would say, what are the chances that there's a woman who would be a great NFL running back? There probably aren't many because they're not is right, they're not right. Just as it just, just as when we say, well, what are the difference in the genders? I mean, clearly women are not as strong. They're, they're, their muscle mass is not um, is not the same level as a man. So, of course, all the records of lifting weight, et cetera, tip towards the, the scale of uh, sort of men being stronger. So, OK, women aren't playing running back. Right. So what? Like, I'm like, so what? That doesn't matter. How <laughs> yeah. about bowling? Why do we separate women out from bowling? How about darts? How about? Oh, yeah, bowling? there we go. That now now it's starting to click like the darts and the bowling like. That makes no sense. sense. That makes no sense. And and when we say as a universal truth, when I say men and women should be playing together, and when we go to, gosh, but they'll get hurt playing running back. I'm like, would you get hurt playing running back? Yeah. Probably. (laughs) Not as big and strong as fast, you know, as Emmett Smith was. Like it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like that doesn't discount all women always. Maybe there's somebody out there, you know, who's the outlier, but let's just take the general rule. Is a woman? Why is a woman not as good as a man in billiards? Right. <laughs> uh, like I'm like, just start listing every sport and say, why would a woman be at a disadvantage? Their kinetic linking, the ability to transfer energy from the ground up through their body, um, you know, through the end of their arm or their, or you know, or whatever, uh, it's not at a disadvantage. So it's my my point is, women are way better than we give them the chance to be. Boom. That's, That's yeah. awesome because it's it's facts, honestly, because yeah, it is. And, and it's crazy because some of the people that are commenting on that are women that are like, no, we shouldn't be up against men. And it's like, you guys should almost want to be up against men. You do. I mean, right. don't you want look to be look, the expression is to be the man. You got to beat the man. It's like to be the best. You got to be you, to be the best. You got to beat the best. Right. Like, no. And when people say, wow, what about so should should Serena Williams be playing men's tennis? Yeah. Yeah, she I should. Mean, <laughs> yeah, she definitely yeah, so should. So she won't have she won't have umpteenth grand slam titles. But right. when people are like she couldn't win a set against it, I'm like, really? So if she started playing <laughs> against only men the like her entire career right. growing up, like every match along the way, you don't think she figures it out? I'm like, you don't have much faith. Like you're putting way too much on, oh, men are just way better. That ball is coming so fast. What? She can't return it? You don't think her reaction time is as good as a man's? Yeah. I'm like, of course it is. Right. Like, it just it there's no there's no scientific proof for it. 
So until someone proves it to me and says, well, gee, you just can't, then I say, party on, man. Let everybody play together and let let everyone sort it out. No big deal. And and it's funny because the, the comments on YouTube or Twitter or anywhere that where I post that idea, when it, it it's oddly this mix of, you know, fathers with sons of how dare you suggest, you know, a girl be playing with my boys. <laughs> and then it's other women saying, what are you doing? Putting women's sports down? I'm like, don't you hear how I'm elevating women? I'm <laughs> right. saying women are better than yeah. we're allowing them to be. We changed. Look at women's lacrosse. You're not even allowed to touch anybody. It's a right. different sport than men's lacrosse. Lacrosse should be lacrosse. Let people mm-hmm. play. That's my opinion. And if there's anyone to trust, it should be you, honestly. I mean, and that's the I, thing that I, I don't understand. You're, you are the sports science guy. And I'm going <laughs> reading these random people's comments on YouTube who have no idea with anything with science. You are the science guy. And, and, it's only, and I've only arrived at this conclusion because of two things. One, I've had the greatest female athletes in the lab. And yeah, right. when I look at them and I compare them, we had Maya Moore and John Wall in the lab at the same time. Mm-hmm. And jo- Maya Moore went through the exact same drills as John Wall, who is the number one pick in the NBA. And, I, and you look at Maya Moore's ability to handle the ball. You look at her accuracy in shooting. You look at how agile she is. She went through all of our drills. And on average, all of our agility drills that we timed down to a hundredth of a second. On average, Maya Moore was slower than John Wall off the dribble by a hundredth of a second. I'm wow. Like, okay. So it's nothing. Yeah, so the, yeah, very he close. Was the number one pick in the yeah. NBA. So <laughs> right. Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, he said Maya Moore could probably play in the NBA. Now, I don't think Maya Moore could play in the NBA now because she hasn't had to play to that level. But if right. she was playing against better competition the whole time, it's not going to be someone like Brittany Griner who like is playing inside because that's more of a physical position. It like if you got you got to have some sort of strength and some sort of leverage to, to win on the inside. But outside, if somebody like Isaiah Thomas, who's my side, could play point yeah. guard and thrive, then why can't Maya Moore? You don't think she could bring the ball up the court and dish it effectively? I mean, like, it's just insulting to me when people are saying, not, you're not gonna, I'm not going to watch women play in my sport. I'm like, okay, you're just wrong. And the second thing is I've got a son and a daughter. My daughter still to this day, she's now 12. She's the fastest human in her class. And I look at that and I'm like, yeah, you want to know why she's fast? Because girls mature faster. She's wickedly athletic. And Mm -hmm. so she's the fastest girl, but she has to play on the girls soccer team. Like she's, so what, what am I missing? Like let her, and I, and I tell her, I'm like, be fast and be the fastest until you're not. I mean, let nature determine that. I'm like, don't let somebody else tell you you're not going to be as fast. I don't know how long you're going to be the fastest. Probably not forever, but ride it while you can. Yeah, no, absolutely. Plus, that will open up the uh, the so-called women's tees for uh, for me then. The That's probably where tees. I should be playing. I mean, it's like <laughs> I should be hitting from the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> As I call it the Brankus tee. I can't hit yeah. it. Can't hit it worth a damn. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Sure. Um, yeah, I was looking at your Wikipedia. You graduated from uh, the University of Virginia. Yep. It said you created your own major. Yeah. How does that? How how did you get through so, that? How? <laughs> yeah. So the uh, my major was the the basis of my major was called Rhetoric, Communication Studies, the Theory of the Argument, and I was like, okay. yeah, it sounds good, but I want to be in entertainment. So the way that I was on uh, the way that I uh, got into it is I said if I craft my own major and figure out a the classes that i want to take i knew i wanted to be in entertainment so i took screenwriting classes i took directing classes you know studied uh you know i studied copeless corsese lucas spielberg studied Mm -hmm. all the greats like literally tailored my major to exactly what i wanted to do and what what, what was fantastic is that it really did help me um you know where i was thinking for a moment you know maybe i should drop out of college i don't know how much good this is doing me it went from being something that I was like, ah, about to being something that really helped me. And the University of Virginia was amazing. So it was a great place to go to school, really helped prepare, prepare me for the next level. Um, and, you know, definitely helped. Okay. Um, Trev mentioned something else you were working on recently. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'm working with a company now called Killcliff, um, K-I-L-L-C-L-I-F-F.com, a clean energy drink company. So 
I've been incredibly fortunate to work with the biggest brands with the biggest messages, um, you know, tailoring ad campaigns for Ford, TaylorMade, Under Armour, Nike, you know, Adidas, uh, literally Coors, Gillette, Nerf, bit, you know, Ford, Toyota, big wow. brands. Yeah. Kill Cliff, which is the up and coming clean energy drink, is really looking to take on, you know, like Red Bull and Monster, the traditional drinks that have too much sugar, too much caffeine, aren't good for you. Was, Kill Cliff was founded by Navy SEALs and has just an unbelievable line of products. Um, it has an incredible CBD drink that's the best selling, fastest growing CBD beverage in the country. Um, and all of their products are really healthy for you. They're, they're good for you. And that's what, what not only are they good for you, but the ethos of the company of giving back, of you know, giving to military charities um, and really spreading, you know, positive energy begets positive energy. And I'm thrilled um, to be the chief marketing officer for Killcliffe and taking all of the knowledge that I have from sports science, taking all of my knowledge I have on nutrition, being able to apply it to Killcliffe and help people understand there is a better alternative out there. Um, so I highly recommend people go to killcliff.com, not because it's like some trendy brand, because it is a brand that is a better choice. It right. is an absolute better okay. choice for you. It's healthier, tastes better. It's something that uh, I really believe in. So I'm thrilled. Oh, I heard you cool. mention uh, CBD. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, what's your thoughts on CB, CBD and also uh, THC also? Do you think uh, like the NFL isn't going to be testing for THC anymore from what I've been hearing? What's your yeah, thoughts you know, on all it's that? interesting because I'm a guy who honestly, I don't drink alcohol. I've never smoked pot ever. Yeah. So sort of like the, the side of THC and even the side of alcohol, you know, I drank alcohol when I was in college, went out on top. I was really good at it. So I had to stop. <laughs> so I would like, I haven't had a drop of alcohol for, you know, 30 plus a year. I just, I just don't drink. Yeah. So, and I, you know, like I said, never smoked pot and the CBD side of everything. It's interesting to me how it, there, there isn't, there is an aspect to CBD and I will not make any scientific claims of this is what it absolutely does. All right. that I can tell you is that based on my own empirical evidence and based on the evidence of everybody I know who is consuming it, who's using it, I've heard very few stories from people who are like, oh, I didn't like it. Oh, it didn't help me. Now, that does not mean that it's this magical you know, ingredient that um, somehow is a cure-all. What it does mean to me, though, is there's something to it. So I don't want to make any claims because the FDA is really looking at right. it. I, don't, I definitely do not want to go out on a limb and yeah. say this is what it definitely does. What I can tell you are the CBD beverages that Killcliff makes, for me, they're, they taste amazing. And to me, it feels like I feel better afterward. That's purely right. anecdotal evidence. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of people who really believe the same thing I do, that there's something to it for sure. Right. What different flavors do you guys have? Yeah, we've got a grape. We call it the goat, the grapest of all time. We've got an <laughs> orange kush. Um, and we also have a uh, mango tango. So those are the <laughs> CBD brands. So, you know, Kill Cliff the, has the orange great. kush. I like that. That Orange kush. Yeah, you know, it's uh, we've got a whole bunch of really creative flavor names. Um, we have a, bro a product called Ignite that's all natural, um, 150 milligrams of natural caffeine, of green tea caffeine, uh, nothing synthetic, nothing, nothing fake, nothing artificial. Um, and our baseline product of Kill Cliff is really kind of like a recovery. It's like an energy energized meets recovery drink um, where it only has 25 milligrams of caffeine. You can crush it all day long, drink it all the time. And that's really the problem is that you know, when you hear someone saying, oh, I drank five Red Bulls today, that's a problem. You know, so right. you can drink five Kill Cliffs and it's not a problem. But five Red Bulls, like with all that caffeine and sugar, that's a problem. Can you only get it online right now? No, it's actually distributed, thre it's thre distributed okay. throughout the country. But online is if you can't find it in your local grocer. We, do, we have a deal with Walmart, with Publix, okay. um, uh, lots okay. of different, um, you know, brick and mortar chains. Mm -hmm. But you, like, honestly, the best way to get it is to go online, killcliff.com. K-I-L-L-C-L-I-F-F. -L -L -F. Um, the CBD site is killcliffcbd.com. Okay. Um, and you should go check it out. Like, Yeah, it, for it's, sure. It's just, yeah. a, you know, it's made by Navy SEALs and, you know, it has that ethos of giving back. Every purchase gives back to the Navy SEAL Foundation. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful brand and a wonderful product. Right. Before we start wrapping this up, I got to pitch you a TV show idea. Go on. All right. So everyone remembers the TV show Pros vs. Joes. Yeah. What about pros versus Twitter trolls? Pros versus Twitter troll. It's kind of like mean <laughs> tweets, right? It's, yeah. Uh, it's like the the mean tweets or 
you know, something to do with, uh, um, you know, getting back at other uh, internet <laughs> trolls. Like, it's so funny because the online community now more than ever is, um, it's so funny how people are big and bold behind the right. you know, social media. I have literally, you know, I've been doing sport and, I'm, and I continue to, to work with the world's greatest athletes. When I tell you, I, I've been so fortunate in doing sports science from 2000, you know, literally started in 2006 and just is run forever. And I'm now have contracts directly with the UFC and Intel and a bunch of other organizations. I have never in my entire life had anyone come up to me and say, you know what? I watched your segment and it was really stupid and dumb. <laughs> and I think you're dumb. But if you right. go on Twitter and you go on, you know, social media, all you yeah. see is Brinkus is dumb. This thing yeah. is stupid. Like nobody would ever say that to me. And there, and if you believe that, then pose your own scientific argument back to me that refutes mine. Right. So you're, you're free to have your opinion. Just <laughs> be confident enough to say it in any forum, not just behind the veil of social media. Right. And that's why I think a show like that could take off. You get them, you know, if you had, let's say, because I'm a Lions fan, right? We got Darius yeah. Slay right now. He's leaving. He's gone. He yeah. hates it. He, he's getting into it with everybody in Detroit. Detroit fans are going after him. We put me and Slay up against each other because I, I kind of bash him every now and then. And we run a 40. He crushes me. And then I have to stop talking shit all the time. I don't know. I, I think it could be, I think it could be a good show. Yeah. It's funny. You know what? It's, it, believe me, it's funny. It's, it's this great. I just don't understand. I mean, even like all the craziness going on in the world right now, what I don't understand is no one could just, it doesn't seem like people just have rational arguments of like, if we're to argue vanilla no. versus chocolate, I mean, can't we just say, I like vanilla. I'm a little, right. I actually don't have, I, I actually like, don't like chocolate. Is that, yeah. isn't that okay? I right. don't like chocolate. Like just always an argument. It's just yeah. like, it, it's like somehow if you don't like chocolate, it's like, Oh, you, like, <laughs> I, I just don't, it's just not my thing. You can like chocolate. Totally right. cool. I just don't consume it. So it's like when you have an opinion, I want people and, and it's funny because the art of rhetoric, the art of the argument is what, you know, the base of my major really is. I, if you can make an argument and make it intelligent and make it coherent, I'm ready. To, I'm totally willing to listen. Right. If you're going to call people names. And if you're going to end up, you know, just throwing ridiculous examples that have nothing to do with the argument and start making completely false scarecrow arguments where you're connecting two issues where no one's even saying that, just don't even bother. But if you want to make a rational argument, I'm all ears. Believe me. Right. I, you know, my boys versus girls argument, I hear, I like, I listen to people and I go, but you're not you're not hearing what I'm saying. Right. What I'm saying is mm -hmm. let nature sort itself out. I'm not saying there's going to be 50% of women in the NFL. I'm saying, yeah. I mean, there should be, we should give people a chance. Women are incredible athletes. That's all I'm saying. So, yeah. Right. For sure. So one more thing, are you 48 yeah. or 49? Because I'm looking at your Wikipedia page and it says 48 slash 49. So <laughs> Does it really? Yeah. So it's you know like, what I am? I'm both because I deal in the realm of quantum physics. So oh wow! Simultaneously. Well, that, Wikipedia's <laughs> Wikipedia's right once again. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, always. And forty nine, depending there on how you're go. counting. Sure. <laughs> Nick, you got any more you want to fire away? Fire no, away. I don't think so. It's fun. No. no? Yeah. So fun. But yeah, guys, a lot of fun. I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate it. I, honestly, I think you guys love Kill Cliff, so check it out. Yeah, yeah. I will for oh, sure. We will. Definitely. Well, before we, before we take off, what any technical difficulties this weekend during the NFL draft? Will there be? Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course. I mean, there, <laughs> of course there will be technical difficulties. I think my I think more than anything, um, there's going to be you know there will be difficulties in. Um, I think that there are going to be unexpected difficulties that uh, no one's ever tried to anticipate because yeah, there are going right. to be hundreds of people involved with the live stream. I'm going to be involved with the with the. Uh, with the NFL draft this year. And it's, you know, it's going to be awesome. Obviously, you know, I'm going to stay within bounds, but who right. knows what people are going to do. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be fun though. I mean, it is that's for sure. I mean, I, I know yeah. I want to watch it just to see what happens. Right. right. It's, it's I, I'm excited for it, but it was actually supposed to be the first draft I was ever going to go to some kind of, I'm kind of upset. Yeah. I was you know, supposed I've to been leave to a Vegas two days ago. Yeah. I've been to a bunch of them with the exception of the number one pick when everybody just has a cow either way. Like yeah, not missing much actually being there live. Right. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But the but the Vegas atmosphere would have been pretty fun, probably. It, it would have minus COVID. Yeah, yeah minus COVID. <laughs> yeah, what what's exactly. your thoughts on everything going on right now with COVID, man? 
You know, I it, here's here's what I think. Here's what I think. I think we all need to ha- be able to have a rational argument. That's what I, a, a rational discussion. I feel like, I mean, you read any headline now, either way, and it gets skewed so far out right. of whack yeah. that it's even hard to talk about it. Um, you know, honestly, you know, it, when this, before this thing even started, I've given all of the stats and everybody is, I'm, I'm sure, exhausted by now of understanding how many people actually die every day from things all over the world. A right. million people a week die. A million around That's the world. Lot. So yeah. when you start seeing what, what what's ended up happening is you start seeing numbers and you see like, oh my God, 10,000 people died, you know, in location X or country X. And that's a lot of people. I'm like, when you compare it to the number of people in the world and the number of people who die anyway, I'm like, yeah, it it sounds like a big number, but you have to make it relative to everything else. It's just like if I gave you $1, but I only had $2, it's a lot of money. But if Mm -hmm. I gave you $1 and I have $7 billion, it's not a lot of money. So a dollar right. is not a dollar. And unfortunately, what, what fortunately what happens is I am as pro-life guys as there possibly could be. I am all for life. I'm yeah. also for recognizing, unfortunately, viruses happen. And, you know, the question of are we dealing with it correctly? Are we overreacting? Are we underreacting? That when people keep saying, let the science dictate, let the science dictate, we started off by saying two million people are going to die. Then it was 200,000. Now it's down. I'm like, what is the science? I think that we all have to say, we're not sure what the science is. We don't really know. So which side of this argument is correct? Can't be, can't, can't be determined. Absolutely. But I don't think we need to be, I don't think it helps to be saying, if you think X, you're insane and crazy. It's listen, I want to hear your point of view. I want to understand it. And then we can have a discussion about the best thing to do. I will tell you that, you know, I do not envy. I mean, look, I, I, if you're the president of the United States without COVID, that job is awful. Yeah. Period. It's yeah. awful. Yeah. Imagine the pressure. Imagine the, <laughs> right. you yeah. know, the briefing room of like, hey, two million people might die. What should we do? You're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Now right. you're a governor. And now you're like, okay, do I open up my state or not? You know, yeah. I can't imagine the pressure of it. And I know what I would certainly do, but you have, it seems like state by state, region by region, town by town, there doesn't seem to be a universal answer right now. So we all need to sort of go on the models. Let's, let's see what people are doing. There are all kinds of different experiments and we'll all determine, we will all determine what's correct and what's the right, right. way to live. And we'll adjust to that. And that'll happen over time. Right. We see these protests right now. Yeah. Obviously, there's there's thousands of people coming together in these small places, right. which is which is pretty scary because obviously with with COVID, how fast it can travel. But what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts on uh, the, all the protests? And do you think that they should be I, doing them or? I mean, look, it, here's what I would say. I get it. I mean, right. I, I understand the mm-hmm. you know, if your choice is I can't pay my mortgage or I'm going to go outside and try to work and say, please open up the business so I can. If people are saying, am I willing to take that risk? And to me, this is the the question you have to answer. Did it ever occur to you that you've always been taking a risk of getting some crazy virus? Like that you've just always been taking that risk. Now, is this virus worse than others? Time will tell, right? Right. Time's going to figure out. I will never say if someone's going out protesting right now and they're saying, hey, I'm protesting because I say, why are you protesting? And if they're saying, because I want to go to work and make money and support my family, I don't I can't see how that's something to disparage. Right, right. I get it. Now, yeah. are they doing it? Does that put them at a higher risk and put somebody maybe, maybe not? I don't know. You know, it, the, the signs can vary on that. But for anybody to look at that group or that person and say, how dare you? I'm like, dude, you're not in their shoes. Just like if you're someone who's going to go out and say, hey, don't open my state because I'm petrified and I don't think we should open up. You have a right to say that. I'm not going to, I'm going to say, I get it. You're scared out of your mind and I understand it. Now let's allow our leaders and let's let all the voices being heard. And let's try to, let's try to discuss this 
civilly because I can clearly see both sides to the argument. Right. I just yeah. I'm disappointed when people are using science to manipulate uh, their argument in a way that's artificial. Mm-hmm. It's the look, you don't really know the answer. So don't, right. so don't so don't be so high and mighty that, you know, the answer, but let people express their opinions and it'll work itself out. That's just how it happens. Right. Do you think we see sports this summer? You know, I think the sports leagues are in a, I think they're in a tough spot. Right. Um, yeah. I, I'm hopeful that there will be a protocol that is agreed upon for sports to resume. And, right. I, and I don't, you know, whether or not it's quarantining everybody in a hotel and having it all played in one location or whatever it is, I just think, look, the sport is a great example of we always throughout human history, look at any culture, we need stuff that's a healthy distraction, right? Because yeah, absolutely. sitting inside, not, <laughs> yeah. you know, not right. discussing and having anything in common. Like you, it, it does do us good to have community and to rally around things and to, you know, want to follow something that isn't business, 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 right? Like it's right. like to, uh, to the average fan, it's, it get, it, it's odd because, uh, you know, at the, on the one hand where people are like, well, what difference does it make? Sports isn't all that important. I'm like, look, I, I'm, I think sports is emblematic of something that can be a hobby, a passion or whatever. I can tell you that my eyes toward like esports has been opened up like oh my god a lot yeah yeah <laughs> esports is going to take over the world I mean it already has right but you get why Twitch is so brilliant and important because to you know my 14 year old son who loves to play Xbox when he's watching Twitch prior to this lockdown prior to the COVID you know, I'd be like, how can you watch somebody play a video game for and then hours you to yourself? You know what? I get it. Right. I get it. Cause it's just like watching an NBA game. That's what yeah. you find entertaining. And that person is giving you insight and entertaining you. I totally get it. So I, my answer is I hope we do see sports. Obviously I miss it dearly. Um, right. I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's hard to say. You mentioned uh, maybe the keeping, I think it was the MLB said about keeping everybody in one hotel and like not letting them even see their family. Really. Do you think that that could actually be an option if they're not able to go and see their family? What, what, what player would commit to that, you know, not being able to leave a hotel and go see their loved ones. You know, it, it's hard. And obviously I can't speak on behalf of, uh, you know, every player, but right. the, the answer of who would do that. The answer is a lot of people. Right? Yeah. Probably not the highest paid players in the MLB, but, the yeah. guys playing the minor leagues will be like, I'll do it. Right. Yeah. Like, Sign me up. So I, I think that there's going to be a, there are going to be some kind of solution. I mean, I can tell you no matter what sport uh, resumes and this is where the NFL, I get a little, I get really worried about cause that's, you know, that's where the rubber really hits the road, right? Like what yeah. happens in the NFL season, what right. happens in college football Yeah, it just seems like, the way that we're looking at opening things back up there inevitably is going to be some sort of, you know, resurgence, you know, in COVID cases, you know, town to town, state to state. And I think it's going to make it very hard to dependably travel from state to state. I think we're kind of going to be in a, you know, in a sort of state of hover. Like, right. I don't know if I'll be able to go to California. I don't know if we can play sports in New York. I don't know. Yeah. So the, I, I think that the solutions that are going to be come up with, are going to minimize travel somehow. And I don't know, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't, you know, obviously we've all heard the um, suggestions, but you know, Dana White building fight Island is a pretty brilliant idea. <laughs> it is. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I all right, so. guys, should we just wrap it up there? I think that's all I got. What about you, Nick? Man. No, yeah, no, I'm good. All right. It's perfect. Awesome dudes. Well, listen, really appreciate you guys having me. Thank you so much. And, you know, everyone keep their chin up. We'll get through this. No for worries. Sure. I appreciate yeah. it, John. Thanks for hopping on. All righty. God bless. Thanks, guys. John. Bye. Bye. See ya. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed episode number five with John Brankus from Sports Science. Obviously, awesome guest. We talked about a whole bunch of different things. Um, one big thing was his Cliff, Kill Cliff drink, which uh, Nick will talk about here for a second. Yeah, Kill Cliff. It- it's uh, it sounds like a nice alternative to some of the uh, other energy energy drinks. As this is more of a all natural kind of thing, no artificial um, ingredients, 
and it's just overall better for you. Right, yeah, definitely go order some Kill Cliff. We already have, so I think you guys will enjoy it. And if you enjoyed this episode with John, be sure to stay tuned for the next episode as we have on Super Bowl champion Pat Lee. He spent time with the Green Bay Packers, and he bounced around the league elsewhere. But he joined us from his wonderful house outdoors in Florida. If you're watching on video of the next episode, it might make you jealous because I'm stuck in snow. He's in the warm. So, guys, go watch that one if you enjoyed this one. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe, leave us five stars, and we'll see you later. Peace.